Hello, my name is Saumya Uma. I work as Assistant Professor of Law in Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. I focus on human rights and the law and one aspect of that is child rights. So today we are there to discuss the second module on juvenile justice system in India. The juvenile justice system in India part 2. In the last module, we discussed about who is a juvenile, what is juvenile delinquency. We also discussed the need for a separate system of criminal justice for juveniles and we further looked at approaches to juvenile justice. We discussed punishment versus rehabilitation and lastly we discussed evolution of juvenile justice law in India. In the present module which is module 2, we will continue the discussion on the Indian legal framework and standards on juvenile justice. We will try and understand the law enacted for juveniles for the first time in 1986, the amendments made to the law in 2000, 2006 and the 2015 law. We will discuss the points of paradigm shift that have taken place over the decades in an effort to conform to international standards on juvenile justice. So firstly, let's look at the Juvenile Justice Act 1986. This law enacted in 1986 was the first formal attempt by the Indian government at streamlining and formulating a specific law for juveniles in India. Some of the important provisions of the 1986 Act. One, it defined a juvenile as a child up to 16 years of age for boys and 18 years of age for girls. Second, children were classified under two categories. Juvenile delinquents who are children under the prescribed age who committed an offence and neglected juveniles who needed care and protection from the state and the state institutions. Third, the act provided for both the categories of children to be kept in an observation home together during the pendency of the inquiry or proceedings. Fourth, the act prohibited an arrested child from being detained in police custody or in jail under any circumstances. Fifth, the law had provisions relating to bail for an arrested juvenile. Bail was to be granted as a matter of right, except in situations where there were reasonable grounds for believing that if the juvenile was released, he or she would come into contact with any known criminal or the juvenile would be exposed to moral danger or the release may result in defeating the ends of justice. Sixth, the institutional mechanisms established under the 86 Act to address the two categories of children were, dif were different. The Juvenile Welfare Board for addressing the needs of neglected juveniles and the juvenile court for dealing with and adjudicating upon juvenile delinquents. Seventh, every juvenile court was to consist of a prescribed number of metropolitan magistrates or judicial magistrates of first class who are called JMFC and were to be assisted by two honorary social workers. Eighth, Every juvenile welfare board was to be constituted by the 
concerned state government of which not less than one member was to be a woman. Next, once the proceedings were completed, the neglected juveniles were sent to juvenile homes while the juvenile delinquents were kept in special homes for a prescribed period of time. The juvenile courts could pass the following orders. One, allow the juvenile to return home after advice or admonition. Two, release on probation of good conduct to parent or guardian or institution for not more than three years. Third, send the juvenile to a special home. Four, impose a fine on the juvenile if he or she is above 14 years of age and earning. Now, let us look at the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2000. From 1986, the 2000 Act marks a paradigm shift in the manner in which the law perceives and treats juveniles. Since India had ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1992, there was a need to bring the domestic law in conformity with the newly evolved and developed international standards that India had agreed to be bound by. Hence, years of effort were focused on revamping the juvenile justice law, which adopted a new philosophy, a new structure and new institutions. Let me highlight some of the salient features of the 2000 Act. A child in this Act is defined as a person who has not completed the 18th year of age. The gender imbalance in the definition of the child or the juvenile under the 1986 Act was rectified in the 2000 Act. Secondly, under the law, children in conflict with the law means a child who is alleged to have committed an offence, while children in need of care and protection, this particular term includes those who are being or who are likely to be grossly abandoned, abused, tortured or exploited for the purpose of sexual abuse or any other illegal act. Third, the law provides a separate treatment of children in conflict with the law and children in need of care and protection. Fourth, even during the pendency of inquiries, unlike under the provisions of the 1986 Act, the two categories of children would not be kept in a designated institution together. The 2000 Act also provided for the establishment of separate homes for different age groups in order to separate the younger offenders from the mature juveniles. This was in conformity with the Beijing rules on administration of juvenile justice. This will be discussed in the subsequent modules. The Act contemplates remand homes, juvenile justice boards and child welfare committees in every district and provides for four types of homes for juveniles, observation homes, special homes, children's homes and shelter homes and in addition after care organizations. Matrix 1 in your notes gives all the details in this regard. Very importantly, the Act incorporates the international standards and it includes a provision stating that the child's right to participation in the proceedings pertaining to him or her. This was provided in section 12 of the 2000 Act. This Act also clearly recognizes that civil society needs to be involved significantly if true justice is to be provided to children. And hence, 
it provided ample scope for the involvement of citizens either through voluntary organizations or through individuals who are public spirited citizens. The rules of the Juvenile Justice Act 2007 forms a model of the rules based on which each state has to prepare its own rules that are necessary to further detail the way in which the 2000 Act would be implemented. Now let me highlight to you some provisions which are specific to children in conflict with the law. Firstly, in all cases of children in conflict with the law, the adjudicating authority would be the Juvenile Justice Board. And this was not the juvenile court as was designated under the 1986 Act. Secondly, the Act would prescribe for establishment of a Child Welfare Committee, CWC, in each district by the state government to focus on issues related to juveniles in need of care and protection. Thirdly, the bail provisions for both bailable as well as non-bailable offences were made more liberal and broad as compared to those for adults under the Code of Criminal Procedure. As a matter of right, the juvenile is to be released on bail with or without surety. Fourthly, the juvenile can be detained in an institution only if there is reasonable ground for believing that the release is likely to bring him or her in association with any known criminal or expose him or her to moral, physical or psychological danger or that his or her release would defeat the ends of justice. These grounds have been retained from the 1986 Act. But even in these circumstances, the juvenile can be detailed only in an observation home and not in a police lockup or prison. Fifthly, the orders that may be passed by the Juvenile Justice Board include 1. Sending home the child after admonition or advice. 2. Performance of community service which was introduced for the first time. Third, release on probation based on good conduct. The only controversial part of the power of the board was the power to send the child to a special home for a minimum period of two years for a child who is over 17 and less than 18 and in case of any other juvenile till he or she ceases to be a juvenile. A proviso authorized the JJB to reduce the period of stay having regard to the nature of offences and circumstances of the case. This particular term appears to give an arbitrary power as there are no indications as to how the discretion by the Juvenile Justice Board was to be used. As in the 1986 Act, there is an express pro prohibition from awarding death penalty or life imprisonment to a child or taking a child into custody for non-payment of fine or for failure to furnish a security. The law also has a stipulation that prohibited joint trial of a juvenile with an adult. The 2000 Act aimed at protecting the privacy of the juvenile for the first time by prohibiting the media from disclosing the name, the address, the school or any other particulars of the juvenile by which his or her identity may be revealed. The 2000 Act also provides for special juvenile police unit called SJPU to be established to effectively handle juveniles and for every police station 
to have a juvenile or a child welfare officer who is supposed to be trained and oriented to treating juveniles with care. Now let me highlight to you provisions which are specific to children in need of care and protection in the 2000 Act. Firstly, the category of children in need of care and protection has been expanded vastly from the 1986 Act. It included child victims of armed conflict, natural calamity, civil commotion, child who is found vulnerable and likely to be inducted into drug abuse, etc. While this expansion may be desirable in itself, this provision has come under criticism as the system remains largely custodial in nature. Hence, how beneficial would it be for a wider gamut of children to be brought under the law? Many have questioned this. The framework of the law remains within the criminal justice system as the police still have the power to contact a child and to produce him or her before the Child Welfare Committee. In fact, contrary to the need to decriminalize the process, the powers of the police have surprisingly been expanded under the 2000 Act. The police have also been empowered to hold an inquiry regarding the child in the prescribed manner. A child may be sent to a juvenile home, reiterating the custodial nature of the child care institutions. Restoration as an option, the concept and the option of restoration of the child to parents or to adopted parents or to foster parents was included for the first time under the 2000 Act as an alternative to institutionalization. This is a very, very important aspect of the 2000 Act. This provision is intended to minimize or avoid the stay of a child in a juvenile home or a special home in appropriate cases. Keeping the child at the center of focus, four options are provided to children in need of care and protection in juvenile homes and special homes where they may be adopted, where or they may be kept in foster care, they may be sponsored or provided after care. Each state has the power to make rules under the act to carve out finer details of adoption and foster care. You already have modules on adoption that you have studied. So this aspect on adoption and foster care has already been dealt with in other modules. But this was the first time that the provision of adoption came to be introduced in the 2000 Act. Now let me highlight to you some of the points of concern and criticisms of the 2000 Act. Authors and experts have highlighted various points of concern and criticism with regard to the 2000 Act. These include the following. Firstly, the 2000 Act is still weighed heavily in favor of custody in institutions. So it is still providing for institutionalization. Secondly, by expanding the powers of the police, the law facilitates criminalization rather than decriminalization. Thirdly, the act is violative of existing human rights standards which have been evolved by states at the international level even though the preamble of the 2000 Act indicates that the law attempts to bring be in conformity with the international standards and to incorporate the international standards into the domestic law. Fourthly, the best interest principle which was incorporated in the 2000 Act endorses a protectionist approach where authorities under the Act determine and decide upon the best interest of the child using their own value framework and belief system. 
such a framework or belief system may enjoy the support of the community, but it may not be in tandem with the evolving perspective on child rights. For example, corporal punishment to children and child labor may be considered legitimate in a particular culture or by a particular community, but it is not necessarily in tandem with international standards. The best interest principle contradicts the right to participation principle, which is also incorporated in the 2000 Act, leading to a confusion as to whether or not a child's opinion on his or her best interest can override the adult imposition of the same through the law. Fifthly, the right to participation provision is incorporated in a nominal way. It is incorporated for the first time but in a very nominal way without any concerted effort at creating a space for the child to participate in and to express his or her views freely at every point of engagement between the child and the juvenile justice system such as for at the point of arrest, at the point of adjudication before the juvenile justice board and at the time of placement in institutions. Unless authorities are trained, they are not likely to hear the child's opinion as well as give due consideration to the child's opinion in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. Sixthly, crucial rights in international legal standards such as the child's right to life, right to equality and non-discrimination, right to humane treatment and dignity, right against torture, cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. These are very, very crucial rights under the international human rights standard, but these have not been incorporated in the 2000 Act. Given the fact that many children face abuse and exploitation in childcare institutions, these provisions are very, very important and should have been incorporated. International standards on juvenile justice, such as the right to maintain contact with his or her family members through correspondence and visits, and the right to privacy, these particular rights have been violated through the state enacted rules that have been formed under the 2000 Act. Seventhly, it has also been pointed out that the Act does not cast any obligation on the part of the state and that a rights based perspective is a missing dimension in this particular law, making juvenile justice more of a charity than as a commitment and a right of the child. Police brutality towards juveniles, the abuse of juveniles in state-run institutions, corrupt practices of state-appointed officials and abuse of power of officials which exist in the juvenile justice system, these, the experts say, defeat the purpose of the 2000 Act and they weaken the implementation of the Act. Experts have also talked about the inadequate infrastructural facilities of many privately run children's institutions which are not registered under the law, abuse including sexual abuse in government run as well as privately run institutions and the poor implementation of monitoring mechanisms such as surprise visits to childcare institutions these have further undermined the effectiveness of this particular law. Now let me tell you about the Juvenile Justice Amendment Act of 2006. In 2006, the law that was enacted in 2000 was amended, aiming at laying down a legal structure for the juvenile justice system in the country. The Amendment Act also aimed at providing a special approach to the protection and treatment of juveniles to outline the machinery and infrastructure required for the same, to establish norms and standards 
for the administration of juvenile justice and to establish linkages and coordination between the formal system of juvenile justice and voluntary efforts in the welfare of juveniles. The 2006 Act provides for the establishment of various kinds of institutions such as 1. Children's homes for the reception of children in need of care and protection. 2. Special homes for the reception of children in conflict with the law. Thirdly, aftercare organizations which would take care of the juveniles after their discharge from the children's homes or as the case may be the special homes. Fourthly, observation homes which are meant for the temporary reception of children during the pendency of an inquiry. The 2006 amendment further introduced important provisions pertaining to adoption in the Juvenile Justice Act. It provides for the court to allow giving a child in adoption to another irrespective of that person's marital status, irrespective of whether or not the adopting parents already have a child of the same sex as the child which is to be adopted to childless couples as well as those who have biological children. In other words, the 2006 amendment broadened the provisions on adoption of children in need of care and protection. For the first time, a secular law was available governing adoptions of non-Hindus as well as Hindus. Prior to 2006, adoption by Hindus was governed by Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act and it continues to be governed by the said act. No other religious community had legal provisions related to adoption. They could only become guardians of a child but not adoptive parents. Now let us look at 2015. In 2015, a new law was enacted which replaced the 2000 Act. The Juvenile Justice Act of 2015 was, pa was partly due to the hysteria created after the Delhi gang rape of 2012 in which one member uh, of the accused was a juvenile and this juvenile was a few months short of 18 years and he was tried as a juvenile and he was sent to a reformation home for three years and he was released in December 2015. While other accused who were adults, they were awarded death penalty. Without understanding the philosophy behind the juvenile justice system, public outcry led to the demand for lowering the age of juveniles under the Juvenile Justice Act particularly when they committed heinous offences so that such juveniles could be prosecuted and sentenced in adult courts. So let me tell you the salient features of the 2015 Act. First, while a juvenile was defined as a child below the age of 18 years, children in the age group of 16 to 18 can be prosecuted as adults if they commit a heinous crime. Secondly, a child between the age of 16 and 18 years who commits a less serious offence may be prosecuted as an adult if he or she is apprehended after the age of 21 years. Thirdly, offences perpetrated by juveniles are classified into three particular categories. First, a heinous crime which is any offence that has a minimum of seven years imprisonment. Second, a serious offence which attracts three to seven years of imprisonment. And third, a petty offence which prescribes three or less than three years of imprisonment. The law provides for establishment of juvenile justice boards in each district 
with a metropolitan magistrate and two social workers, including a woman. The juvenile justice boards will conduct a preliminary inquiry of an offence committed by a juvenile within a specified time period and determine if the juvenile should be sent to a rehabilitation centre or to a children's court or to be tried as an adult. The board can take the help of experts such as psychologists and psychosocial workers and other experts to take this decision. Another salient feature is that the 2015 Act mandates establishment of child welfare committees in each district with a chairperson and four other members who have experience in dealing with children. One of those four members must be a woman, at least one. The committee decides whether an abandoned child should be sent to an institution or should be put up for adoption or for foster care. Another salient feature is that the 2015 Act has further attempted to streamline the adoption process of orphaned, abandoned and surrendered children by empowering CARA, which is the Central Adoption Resource Agency, to frame rules and regulations for the adoption of children in need of care and protection, both within the country as well as from outside. So both in country as well as inter-country adoption. While there is no bar to single, divorced, widowed or spinster men and women adopting a child, a single man is prohibited from adopting a girl child. Another feature is that the 2015 Act introduced foster care in India for the very first time through Section 44. This is very important. Families can register with the government and volunteer to foster children in need of care and protection or children in conflict with the law. Such families which volunteer to foster children will receive a particular amount from the concerned government. As highlighted above and as discussed, the 2015 Act incorporates many laudable provisions. However, public discourse and discussion has ensued on the desirability of treating 16 to 18 year olds who commit heinous offences as adults and prosecuting such juveniles in adult courts. So one important question before us is whether 16 to 18 year olds who commit heinous offences, should they be treated as adults? Before the passage of the 2015 Act, the bill was considered before the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Human Resource Development. In its 246th report, this committee observed as follows. It said that the existing juvenile system is not only reformative and rehabilitative in nature, but also recognizes the fact that 16 to 18 years is an extremely sensitive and critical age requiring greater protection. Hence, there is no need to subject them to different or to the adult judicial system as this will go against Article 14 and 15.3 of the Constitution, which actually talk about the fundamental right to equality. However, since the recommendations of the committee are not binding on the Parliament, the Parliament decided to ignore the recommendations of the Standing Committee and enact the provision as a law. The Supreme Court of India, in Two very, very important judgments delivered in July 2013 and March 2014 supported the provision position that all children who have been accused of crimes under juvenile justice laws, they should not be incarcerated in an adult court. The Supreme Court 
In one of the cases that is Salil Bali case, it said the age of 18 has been fixed on account of the understanding of experts in child psychology and behavioral patterns that such an age, uh, the children in conflict with the law could still be redeemed and restored into mainstream society. In the other important judgment, that is Subramanyam Swami and others versus Raju, the Supreme Court again observed as follows. It said, there is a considerable body of world opinion that all under 18 persons ought to be treated as juveniles and that separate treatment ought to be meted out to them so far as offences committed by such persons are concerned. The avowed object is to ensure their rehabilitation in society and to enable the young offenders to become useful members of the society in later years. So in both the judgments, the Supreme Court has actually talked about against the provision which has come in. Human rights and child rights activists have also raised serious concerns over this provision of treating 16 to 18 year olds as adults. The arguments given against treating 16 to 18 year olds as adults when they commit heinous offenses include the following. One, the provision is grossly violative of the Indian constitution and international standards on juvenile justice, which India has an obligation to comply with. Secondly, the provision is regressive in nature as it moves towards retribution and incarceration rather than reformation, rehabilitation and mainstreaming of the juvenile in society. Thirdly, since it presumes that adolescents who have committed a heinous offense are beyond redemption and should be condemned to a jail sentence, it precludes the possibility of rehabilitation, reformation and reintegration of that juvenile. Fourthly, the provision fails to take into consideration the manner in which the society and the state have failed to protect and guide the juvenile during his or her growing years, which often contribute to the juvenile's commission of a heinous crime. Fifthly, neurobiologically, juveniles in the age of 16 to 18 years are different from adults as their prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain responsible for impulse control and reasoning is not fully developed among the adolescents. What this does is it leads to emotional, impulsive and risky behavior. At the same time, the elasticity of their brains makes them receptive to rehabilitation methods. Sixthly, the procedure by which authorities are to assess if the adolescent's mental capacity to determine if he or she should be transferred to an adult court is fraught with errors and arbitrariness and will be influenced by inherent biases that the authorities may carry. And lastly, the transfer of an adult adolescent from the juvenile justice board to a court would violate the presumption of innocence of all juveniles, which is a very, very foundational principle in juvenile justice, as it would be assumed that the juvenile has committed the heinous offense. This in turn would adversely affect and impact the fairness of the particular trail. So let us come to the conclusion. The status of juvenile justice in India has been aptly summarized by the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, that is NCPCR, in the following words. And I quote the NCPCR, which says, in principle, 
our country has one of the most advanced juvenile justice systems in the world today with a strong child centric focus and a clear separation between adult and child jurisdictions. However, there is a long way to go in the implementation and realization of this system. Children ended up worse than what they were before they entered the juvenile justice system with abuse and a lack of access to basic entitlements of education and health prevalent across custodial institutions. Backlogs of pending cases of children in conflict with the law before the juvenile justice boards have been reported in some states, long term institutionalization with uncertainty and deprivation of education, health and other entitlements continue to be the bane of the system. Although there has been a total paradigm shift in the language of the Juvenile Justice Act, which looked at restoring the self-worth and dignity of the child through counseling and through appropriate rehabilitation, this spirit is not reflected on the ground. With this, we come to the end of module 2 on juvenile justice, which focuses on developments in Indian law and in the Indian legal system. As said for the last module, this module 2 is not exhaustive, but is meant to give you an overview. Please read the notes as well as the references which have been given for module 2 to gain a deeper understanding of the issues discussed in this module. There is enormous material that is available on the internet for your reference, some of which has been given to you as references to module 2. Reading such material will give you a better and a broader understanding of the juvenile justice system in India. Thank you.